Mm, 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 mm. I haven't even thought about the books that made me. I better think of my answer. Go through the shelf and look at the book over. This is uh, the Quackcast. This is Quackcast number 386. I'm Ozone Ocean. And with me today is uh, Tansarin. Hi, Tans. Hello. And Mr. Baines. Hi, Baines. Hello. And no Pitt, because Pitt is with her sister. So let's uh today we're going to talk about the books that made us these are the books that made us so uh this is um an interesting topic so we're going to talk about uh, our literary in- influences that guided us uh to become the people we were and uh you know and maybe you can sort of leave comments about telling us your books that made you which would be interesting because it's mm-hmm. always cool to know yeah. about that. Yeah. Do an episode on that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, before we get into that, uh, the featured comic, Kwai is going to give us that. So, uh, Kwai, give us the featured comic. <laughs> Hello, this is Kwai Daigakse, and the feature I've selected for this week is One Heart by Ocean Rabbits, and it is rated T14. Rio, a high school student, is having a very vivid dream of his friend Eloise. His dream takes a violent turn that almost ended in tragedy if it were not for his friend Lance waking him up from his dream. The only problem is that Rio is now over half an hour late for school and has to start the day on the wrong foot. Hopefully things will improve when Eloise shows up. The art is drawn using very clean digital lines and is mostly in black and white. The pages have a style similar to manga, but the pages are read from left to right. Discover the start of a romance story and read One Heart by Ocean Rabbits. Rated T. And that was Kwai's feature. Thank you for that, Kwai. Okay, and now for our featured music by Gamolas. So let me tell you about the featured music. And that was our music uh, from Gum Wallace. Thank you for that, Gum Wallace. Okay, so the books that made us. I I know, uh, like, Bane's, uh, yours was Mein Kampf and Tan's yours was uh, The Fountainhead, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. How What's that? Oh, it's How obvious. How yes. yes. Your, your advanced political training. <laughs> my campfire stories. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, yeah, could only have been gained for an intellectual giant at such a time. No, no, no. Let's. Um, oh, I'll start because I'm a big mouth. Um, uh, when I was younger, I loved, loved, loved fantasy and fairy tales. I could not get enough of that. Oh my God, C.S. Lewis was my God. I loved him and uh, Enid Blyton. You know, magic faraway tree and the wishing chair and that kind of stuff oh fantasy i loved it and Grimm's fairy tales and um all that kind of stuff and arthurian legends just ate it up i loved fantasy that was what i started with tolkien the hobbit lord of the rings oh my god that was my thing how about you guys I liked a lot of um, horror short stories, even when I was a kid. Oh. I had some young adult books, some, uh, some sci-fi fantasy, a lot of titles I don't remember now, but stuff that I really liked and some plot things that still stay with me. Um, I, I was like, maybe more because the series was available than for any other reason, but I loved reading so much. So I started reading the Hardy Boys. <laughs> Although I don't remember anything, huh. any details about the books now, I would read them voraciously. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, on top I of that was to comics, of course, Mad and Archie. And, sorry. Yeah. So forth. Yeah. Love Mad Magazine. Yeah. Tons? Mm. I, I had uh, a love of books and, and I would, uh, I had this, uh, this feeling and this, um, theory that if it is a book, it's good. So you read it mm. without question. Yeah. At least, or, or, um, if it's in book form, it so it's all equal. If it's if it's a book, it's good. So yes. <laughs> um, so I would be going through the library at my school, and I was blessed with a really huge, huge library. And I would go through the shelves and I would literally just, you know, pick out anything that uh, caught my eye, basically. So I read pretty much anything that had to do with fairy tales, okay. uh, old, old legends, mythologies, uh, you name it. Proud Night, Fair Lady, I remember. Um, I read fairies, um, and that's how I started uh, really looking for uh, painting and drawing compilations. That was my gateway book. Um, oh, the Brian Froud fairy book. Yes. Yeah, I love um, that. Oh, my God. Oh, it was, it was uh, mesmerizing. I, really, I actually bought that afterwards yep, because I wanted same. to have it. Um, <laughs> And then um, I also then um, went to reading anything that was of the old classics from from Frankenstein to Roald Dahl to um, oh, yeah. all of those uh, Disney-fied uh, books. I went to read and I got uh, I got a shock yeah. <laughs> after reading them because they were nothing like Disney. Um, and then I got uh, into the harder stuff like um, uh, Victor Hugo and and uh, black black sort of literature in the sense I don't know how it we call it very very dark literature in the sense that it describes without any sugar coating extremely harsh job situations. I remember there there were some books that I couldn't read through uh, without taking breaks, long breaks, and and I will still not go back to read them again. One one of those was by Emile Zola, Germinal, and read it at your own risk. Okay. It, it is an amazing book. It's extremely well written. And that's the problem, that it is extremely well written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
And it's basically about the revolution of the coal miners um, in France at around in the 19th century. I don't remember exactly when it, it happened, but it was, it doesn't end well, spoilers. Yeah. And and it it really brings out all the problems of social inequality and and uh, the upper classes exploiting the lower classes and and everything in between. Okay. And it doesn't pull any punches at all, at all. And I read it when I was very young, and it it is burnt into my memory, and I. I highly recommend it, but I also highly warn that if you're gonna read it, you're going to have to know what you're getting into. I didn't know what I was getting into when I started. So, <laughs> wow. Yes. Well, I don't know. For me, I I didn't ever really get into stuff that was um, really political or whatever. You know, I read a smattering of Dickens and. And that kind of stuff, but I really preferred the fantasy. That was my thing, and you know, specifically that that high fantasy that was written by those, you know, uh, mm -hmm. idealists of the British Empire. Um, uh, what's his name? Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis and all, and those kind of mm -hmm. people. So I had a and and Blyton, you know, a very uh, British kind of sensibility I gained from that kind of reading and I remember actually um, because I loved fantasy and I loved the covers that was my main thing you know, the illustrations the drawings the artwork and that really drew me into it so I'd seek out books that had similar artwork and there was a book sale in my primary school one day and they were selling a bunch of books and one of them had a picture of dragons on the front I thought oh I'll have that and it was um, something about Lankmar by uh, Fritz Lieber who's a famous mm -hmm. fantasy writer but he's on the other end of the spectrum from uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien he was writing he started writing in the 30s but he was a, an American writer and this book was written in the 1960s or something like that and it's like you know it's the sex drugs and rock and roll version of fantasy and for a very mm. young person that was a very uh, rude awakening for the um rather than the high fantasy suddenly it was dumped right into the um sword and sorcery fantasy and mm -hmm. it's very dark uh 1960s version of it and that was um oh my god suddenly <laughs> it was <laughs> being thrown into a bath of cold water um so that was a bit of a, an awakening for me sort of seeing the other side of it and funny enough, that continued because um, as I, uh, you know, I didn't really like that myself, but as I got older and I was, you know, still enjoying fantasy very much, I'd be devouring all the fantasy books in the libraries of my schools. And, you know, after all, you eat up all the, because, you know, there's not that much fantasy to go around, uh, you know, the old style. So you eat up all that and then you just go through all the other books with the fantasy covers and the, for some reason, my libraries used to buy these really um, eclectic sort of fantasy books of everything from Terry <laughs> Pratchett to, you know, the, those kind of uh, more common adventure things like, uh, I don't know, Forgotten Legends or whatever they are, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons kind of ones, Dragon Lance, those kind of ones. And just all sorts of weird things, you know, there'd be characters who were like, um, uh, like, a gay magician who is in a relationship with a fire elemental who is, you know, it's was like all sorts oh, of wow. <laughs> bizarre stuff. And I'd just be, um, oh, and Tanith Lee, my God, she is a, an amazing fantasy writer, but she writes the most, um, she, she was writing in the 1970s, but she writes the most, um, you know, the characters who are gender fluid and all this kind of stuff, very much gender fluid, you know, um, transsexual kind of characters, characters that have, you know, all kind of the things we think are totally modern now about, you know, oh, social justice warriors trying to, you know, she was, there was a whole yeah. bunch of people like her 
who were just full on with that kind of stuff back then and were brilliant mainstream writers who were doing that. And so this was the kind of stuff I was reading. So I was really um, learning about all that kind of stuff all the way back then, which was interesting. I'm surprised it's such a big issue now, really, because this was, you know, this was mainstream fantasy back then for me. So, yeah, that's what really um, informed my sensibility about the world, <laughs> reading that kind of stuff. How about you guys? Oh, Tance, you, you like thrown into the deep end with the political stuff. What about you, Baines? Yeah. What, what was your moment when you had a turning point from the really childish stuff to the stuff that opened your vista a bit more? Well, I'm hoping that day will come soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I feel like... You wait. <laughs> it's about to change. Yeah. Maybe it's time. It's all about to change. You can feel it coming. Um, I can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be, I would put it uh, a lot of it to, uh, hmm, well, that's a good question, dude. It's like to comics, I guess, like sort of that's where I got a lot of my vocabulary was from reading comics. Uh, a lot of the novels I was reading were not as advanced in the writing. It was like, I, I had a way better vocabulary than a lot of my classmates, mostly because of comics. Um, they were written at a pretty high level. Like some of the X-Men stuff when I was growing up was like really good and nobody else was reading that stuff where I grew up. So, um, I mean, I learned a lot from that and sort of like fantasy um, comic book versions of sort of fantastical ideas, you know, that I would read later in novels and like okay. would be mind bending to other people. I was like, no, it's not that mind bending. <laughs> Seen you it in X-Men. Like Doctor man. Strange or something? <laughs> oh, I wasn't reading Doctor Strange specifically, but it was a lot of the um, cosmic and horror and fantastical stuff in X Men. A lot of that stuff was quite literate. Yeah, uh, the Chris Claremont stuff, like it was, you know, compared to a lot of stuff I was reading anyway, it was like yeah, cool. very complex, very literate, long form storytelling, um, deep kind of character stuff, okay. and everything. Um, as far as you know grown up literature i never got there <laughs> and I, was, I hit a certain age and i started getting dumber so i'm on the downslide now but... yeah that happens with all of us <laughs> yeah. that happens you, you regress i actually forgot yes. one of the things that um before I, I ran out of the you know the uh the tolkien's and the c.s lewis's and stuff the other thing i was massively into was um the norse myths and the greek myths which I absolutely loved. And I think that was partly reaction to, you know, having um, uh, going to Catholic school when I was like in grade one and we were sort of had to have the, you know, the whole Christian kind of experience and, and being brought up with Bible stories. And I hated the New Testament stuff, but I loved the Old Testament, you know, oh, that, that God kind of stuff. And you get the same experience out of the Greek myths and... Um, the North Smiths. So I loved the Greek myths, and I had this great little book on astronomy. So not only could I, I learn about you know pulsars and quasars and you know how many moons Neptune had and all this kind of stuff, it had all the Greek myths in it because it was talking about say oh um, you know yeah. Canis Canis Minor you know whatever the star systems Andromeda and all this. So it tells tells you about Andromeda and then it tells you about the myth behind it and Hercules and orion and stuff like that and then it has the myth about it oh my god i love the greek myths and so that was a big thing for me learning about you know the, all the gods and that kind of stuff as well as the the hard science of astronomy and focal length of mirrors and all that just because i loved the myths so much and it was in the same book so yeah mm. i was i was big into i wasn't a science nerd but i just picked up all the science stuff anyway because i loved books with it just happened to have it in there <laughs> i guess yeah yeah i guess where i got most advanced i was actually really into english and i actually even did some english classes late high school and after high school but uh i, I guess I, I got into sort of complex character stuff and um you know literary themes i didn't get all that great but i did love a little i loved a little shakespeare 
Oh, yeah. Well, I loved a little bit of uh, Chaucer, although I don't remember much. I've never read any. And then I tried a little uh, James Joyce, and then it's like, I, this, uh, I'm not smart enough for this. Yeah, you think, <laughs> oh, I picked up the wrong Ulysses, damn it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, very, very, very much into literature. I, perhaps because I was... Um, uh, I was a very, very much a loner, not lonely, but I didn't, I didn't really feel like, uh, you know, socializing all that much. It, I got tired easily uh, talking about basically the same things. So books were far more exciting for me. So I was extremely into literature. Um, I also read Chaucer. I, I really liked Chaucer, and uh, and his very tongue-in-cheek approach to everything, um, okay. and 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 I remember jumping to Chaucer through Shakespeare, basically, and yeah. and uh, from Shakespeare, I loved, I absolutely loved his tragedies, what a surprise. Um, and um, but the, th- the reason I liked the, the tragedies were mostly uh, not for the main characters, but for all the peripheral characters doing the commentary. Ah, yeah, the yeah, they were the interesting <laughs> ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, like okay, for example, I I remember um, really liking Macbeth, and uh, and watching everything come apart was fascinating by seeing the reaction of other people to Macbeth. And and that was the thing that I really loved in Shakespeare, that he usually, like, okay, he presents, you know, he, they have the, the big monologues and, and the very high drama and everything. But the one thing that really drives home the characters, the main characters' uh, course through the action is how their environment changes towards them. And and that was always what uh, fascinated me. Uh, okay. That's why I actually like Mac- Macbeth the best yeah. out of all his yeah. works. Hamlet is the only one I ever got into, but that was in high school. And that was just funny because... Well, it's not funny... Because it's so, there's so many things in there, you know, that, uh, there's all the great speeches of, you know, ruminating about life and death and all that kind of stuff. Just so applicable to a, a high schooler. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he's always wearing black and stuff like that. And he's, he's going, oh, <laughs> all that stuff. So mm-hmm. that is such a good book for a high schooler. And it's a very simple plot, which makes it very enjoyable. And there's a lot of stuff in there. So, yeah, I liked Hamlet, which is a really common one. It's just one of the big... <laughs> yeah. I remember... Ones. I remember I was the... I, when we were reading Hamlet, I I pissed off my, my professor because... I I didn't like how I like the I like the the, the tragedy. Um, it's amazing, of course, but I hated Hamlet. Oh, <laughs> and he's I still a dick. He's, him... he's a complete yeah. dick in every single way. Isn't he? He he's terrible. He's one of the most spoiled main characters that that, in my opinion, Shakespeare has written. Yeah, he's nasty yes. to his um. To Ophelia and his mum, and yeah. his stepdad, obviously. Because fair enough, he thinks he killed his real dad, but spoiler, but <laughs> still, he's a <laughs> spoiler. He's just a bastard to everybody. Even poor old dead Yorick, he's a dick to him as well. Dig up his head. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> he's just a bastard. Stroppy, spoiled a, young man. He's, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's very egocentric. And okay, granted, he, he has terrible issues uh, with what happened to his father and everything. 
and it is a big deal, absolutely. But I have seen other characters handle it much, much better than he ever did. And my my professor was in love with Hamlet, and she really didn't. I mean, she didn't like me during that season. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only yeah. thing good about him is the way he dresses. That's that's cool. That's I mean, Kenneth Branagh. Hey, that's Kenneth Branagh style, though. Oh, Hamlet's <laughs> always dressed in black. That was that's his uh, the trademark. That's in the play, oh, stated in, in the play. black. Okay, okay, yeah. in the black outfit. Okay. The actors usually, um, yeah, make that as their their choice because it uh, highlights the, um, you know, his, mm-hmm. you know, he's a dark personality, and that's just been mm-hmm. the thing, you know. You famous uh, depictions, you know, Lawrence Olivier, people like that, all in uh, that kind of thing. So it's he is the goth teen boy. Until we got Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly, he's the successor. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I made a, a huge a transition when I ran out of all the fantasy, even the weird fantasy. Then I made the transition to sci-fi. Even though back when I was a teen, I used to consider oh, fantasy is fantastic. Fantasy is cool. Sci-fi is for nerds. You know, you have to be a real like um, weirdo to like sci-fi but then i found you know there were there just weren't enough fantasy to go around i ate all of them i gobbled them all up and mm-hmm. so then i had to make the jump to the 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 other kind of books with the fantastic cool covers which was uh sci-fi but i made the jump through the gateway novels which are and mccaffrey's books pern because they've got oh, okay. dragons yeah. on them and the dragons are pern dragons are this dragons are that so i thought you know they look fantasy, but they weren't. They're sci-fi in disguise. And that <laughs> got me into sci-fi. And now, my God, I'm a complete convert. I love fantasy more than I love sci-fi more than fantasy. I just, yeah. just fell in love with it, and I enjoyed it. And, and then sci-fi became my big thing. And when I was uh, in my late teens and 20s and stuff like that, so I was a massive sci-fi nerd. I loved it. You guys ever get into sci-fi? Not like as a... I wasn't wasn't, um, disliking it, but I don't think I ever actually had like an absolute love of the genre at the time. Um, But I, I... Some of my... Like my one favorite um book one of the in my top 10 favorite books at least is science fiction and i believe it is one of the most um, well described and brilliant allegories for many things and it's uh, the gods of foxcroft i have probably mentioned them the mentioned the book uh okay. before but it is this uh os- um, it's by David David Levy, or I don't know how to call him, how to pronounce his his right. last name. And and uh, the, the plot is, uh, we follow this uh, this man who is terminally ill, and he signs this contract to get the cryogenically frozen until uh, a cure is found for his disease. Oh yeah, you and about this one. Yes, and, and so he wakes up and he doesn't know how much time has passed and we follow his foray into this future world that has developed and as we learn lately la- later in the, in, the, in the novel for probably a couple of millennia and uh, since he got uh, under mm-hmm. and how basically humanity has unlocked and controls death. So you can't die unless they let you. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of it. Because, of course, uh, spoiler, quote-unquote, he gets cured 
he's cured when he wakes up, so yeah. he's absolutely healthy. And then he gets uh, uh, slowly introduced in this new reality and new society and, uh, and new rules and new ethics. And he, he absolutely manages to make it bizarre, to make it alien, to make this be a society that could plausibly have developed from our society, but be nothing like it anymore. Yeah. Um, and I and and again, I highly recommend this book if you ever get it, if you ever if you can, uh, if you get across it, pick it up. I don't think you will re- regret it. It is also in the first person limited, the point of view, which is one of my favorite narrative. Uh, uh, let's say devices. Hmm. So, yeah, oh, how cool. a lot of uh, how I write came from that book. Oh, all right, yeah. And what's it called again? This book, The Gods of Foxcroft. Fox. Let me find. The Gods of Foxcroft. I've put that in the Quackcast notes. That brings to mind actually um, when. Um, I was searching around for for sci-fi books to read. I came across, I I got in, one of the authors I got into, I previously mentioned, Tanith Lee, who makes bizarre uh, fantasy. And I think this was by Tanith Lee. Um, She wrote this uh, really cool sci-fi novel called um, Don't Bite the Sun. That was it. And, oh my God, I just fell in love with that one and I think that's a huge influence on me because now in this one again it gives you a believable version of the future and the good thing about sci-fi is it's um it's often not based on real future prognostication it's based on uh people looking at the trends of that they find themselves in you know at in the contemporary world and extrapolating them into the future and going, you know, what will the future be like if the current trends continue? And so this book was written probably in the, the early seventies or the late sixties, something like that. And so it had that version of, uh, the future. So, and which is quite persient in a lot of ways because, uh, in this story, everybody is, is like, um, completely uh you know fluid in what they want to be if people want want to present themselves in one way or other they can get like plastic surgery and um they can be completely changed into whatever they want to appear death is optional basically people live forever um drugs are totally legal so everybody's in whatever party drugs they want um being an adult is you know frowned upon people sometimes get into that for a little while but then basically you know the parents will sort of uh let their children fend for themselves and the parents will become sort of children again you know like teens they'll be they'll have younger bodies and they'll go go out and party and all that kind of stuff and and that's how life is which is very prescient because that's more and more what's happening now and also they have these things called bees which are these uh, little floating drones that float about uh, people and sort of, you know, uh, take selfies of them and uh, handle their communication. Basically like an iPhone or whatever, but it's floating beside your head. And, yeah, this was written in the 1970s, and it's just it was just so Persian, and it had all this, um, you know, massive focus on youth culture. It's like youth culture has taken over. Youth culture is all. And society was managed by robots, and AI and it had become very um, sort of patriarchal and guiding and it could do that and humanity was basically turned into like uh, juvenile we all be- all became juvenile because now the technology had become our our parent for us and it really it really does sort of focus on what at the way our society is going now it becomes we, we're offloading more to the technology and the technology is taking over more more of the role and it's letting us as adults you know all of us are as adults but we do have quite juvenile interests in a lot of ways you know we do web comics and all that kind of stuff you know it's not really juvenile but it is from the point of view of our, our parents and our parents parents you know because they had to deal with way more mature stuff than we have to do now 
So, yeah, that's, that book was um, one of my favourites for that. And it's a, quite a short one, too. It's, there's a sequel called uh, Drinking Sapphire Wine, which takes it in a slightly different direction. But, yeah, I would highly recommend those ones. Very modern, hmm. modern books. I think um, uh, that uh, the Gadget of uh, Foxcroft was also written in the 70s, if, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe it's like part of this movement that really made leaps into what might have been or might we, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, in certain times, people really do come up with, uh, you know, really persient sci-fi, like in, of course, the, in the 1920s and 30s or whatever, you know, you've got books like 1984 and um, uh, Brave New World, things like that, that uh, tell us a lot about, you know, um, they, they have uh, uh, very clever reflections on what our society is and what it could be if it continues down that path and it's it's quite intelligently done obviously 1984 has a lot of um there's a lot of things you can point to from whenever from world war Two all the way through you know the cold war even to now people can always bring up examples of things that are you know big brother this and you know peace is war war is peace all that kind of stuff it, it it's constantly has um uh a lot of value to uh it's 1984 it's here people yes <laughs> it's always 1984 <laughs> always it's coming true always yeah and brave new world with its focus on genetic manipulation and uh, eugenics mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, this is the lower caste, and you're born to be this way. This is the upper caste, and um, people taking drugs mm -hmm. in order to divorce themselves yeah, from reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it all all has uh, a lot of value. So that 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 come from well, in the in the 1920s, 1930s, obviously huge political change influenced them. And we're talking about books in the 1970s again. Huge political change influenced those, and they are um, product of a time. You know when obviously that change was happening, but then they're sort of looking into the future, and it could lend them way more interesting insights than you know maybe a time of excess in the 1980s. Maybe there wasn't such. Clever sci-fi. I mean, you've got uh, what was the big sci-fi in the nineteen eighties? Um, Neuromancer by um, William Gibson. That kind of book, you know, that was that's the only one I can really remember at the moment that is uh, seen as being a, a huge kind of uh, a big big novel. Can you can you guys think of any of them? In the eighties. Mm, I mean, sci-fi at least. I suppose there's other. Sure. I remember generally Isaac Asimov was very. Oh, he was. Yeah, dead he came back in the eighties, wasn't he? Uh, well, no, no, no. I think he came back and he did. I know he did sequels to the robot novels and the Foundation series, I believe, also in the eighties. He, he died in about eighty nine or something, eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so these books like were released in the mid late eighties, I think, and they were amazing books to me, especially the robot ones. Um. Hmm. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't want to just steer this towards sci-fi. <laughs> that's that's very <laughs> wrong of me because you, you guys have quite different interests. You know, Bane's with your comics and Tarts with your, you know, Dickens and political books. So yeah, that, well, it was, that was what I was into. It wasn't only political. I mean, I I have this uh, feeling that people will uh, will have a mental image of me. <laughs> Sitting under the Che Guevara uh, poster, <laughs> reading political books, um, just for the sake of it. It's just that they, they I guess, um, a lot of um, a lot of the young adult, let's say, literature of the time, at least the ones, what was available for young uh, people and kids 
in Greece at the time that I was growing up had a very strong uh, element of social discourse, at least. Um, but it wasn't a conscious thing. You were literally surrounded by it. Even the pulp fiction had little, which was the, the silliest, most uh, shallow drabble you could find, uh, still at times had little uh, epiphanies of social discourse in it. Uh, that you would that you would um, come across out of the blue. Like I remember, for example, I, I've uh, I've talked often about uh, the World War II pulp fiction with the James Bond slash Superman young group of kids that were always uh, you know uh, up up show, showing um, showing themselves to be superior to the Nazis, uh, like like the Nazis are. Uh, some sort of punch and judy men that yeah. were there to be, and... yeah, which they absolutely were not. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, even in that, which had as silly things as you know, rescuing a Chinese princess that shouldn't exist at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, in the nineteen forties. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So imagine I'm, I'm like to give you a gist of how insane it was I remember very very clearly because it completely threw me out of this atmosphere because suddenly there was this this paragraph uh, of uh, of a speech that the main character was was saying and it was a, a thorough and pretty accurate um, critique of how uh, politics were going to ravage the country oh, God. after the war. Yeah. And it just, you know, made, made you do a double take and and, and uh, check again that you are still reading the pulp fiction thing. So, <laughs> and the reason I'm, I'm saying this is just to give you a gist of, of how it was growing up in Greece in the, in the 80s, basically. So, there's that, but there was also a lot of like I remember reading Storm a lot, <laughs> which wasn't a comic for kids, but I read the, all of it. You mean like um, the X Men Storm? No, 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 a Storm, <laughs> the the very sexy Storm, the one that uh, looks uh, super. Let, let me find who it was by. I always forget. Uh, storm graphic novel. Uh, it's like if you see the covers, it looks like something that is definitely not for kids. So I'm <laughs> gonna show you in a second. Um, Interesting. I want to see this. <laughs> of course you do. Um, so that was like a fantasy slash uh, science fiction thing. Um, Let me find. I can't find any of the very raunchy ones, but here is one that is relatively tame. Um, here you go. Okay. <laughs> Oh, all right. That looks like a barbarian kind of thing. Yeah, it's not. It's uh, the story is about this. Uh, it's very much a planet of the apes without the apes. I think, in the sense that there is this uh, this guy that uh, now looks blindfolded and very barbarian looking. Uh, he is an astronaut actually, and um, he returns back to Earth. But uh, after going through this uh, weird space thing, so when he returns back to Earth, it's several thousand years into the future and everything is absolutely alien. And you have uh, humanity having um, gone full, full circle, so they are back to being all barbarians. <laughs> but there are, 
there are all the relics of the previous civilization. So you have huge spaceships that still work somewhat, but they don't actually work as they used to. So they are like uh, traps, very, very dangerous ones. And there are guns that some people can use and some others can't. So you have this very weird, maybe Dune style fusion between uh, fantasy, sword and sandals, and science fiction. Awesome. That mm-hmm. and sounds great. Um, that sounds like it's in- influenced by, um, sorry, uh, John Carter on Mars. And those yeah, yeah. It, it, it feels a lot like uh, that. I think that uh, Storm was before that. Oh, really? In general, um, I think so, but I could be wrong. Um, and it was this huge uh, graphic novel series, and I read all of it when I was too young mm-hmm. to understand uh, that it was too sexy for me. I didn't get any <laughs> of the sex. I, oh. I was in it for the adventure. Um, so there's also that. And uh, another thing that I... Uh, was mad about was also the Hardy Boys. I had the oh, like I hated Nancy Drew. Oh my yeah, so was I. Yeah. Yes, I didn't like Nancy Drew. She got on my nerves a lot. <laughs> but I absolutely loved the Hardy Boys, even though uh, there was a very very clear self insert of the author in the best Hardy Boy of the two. Like Frank is definitely the author. The author. Oh, okay, I read that later. Yeah, I've read about that later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember them well enough, but they were very goody two shoes, very capable. Oh yes, yeah. and they wrote the convert flawless. Yeah, yeah. they were uh, two reads for their own good. I think <laughs> very American in that way. Well, I yeah. think from the other thing I missed out was uh, I really loved uh, comedy, sci-fi, and fantasy. In that, uh, in the form of Terry Pratchett, you know the great, late great Terry Pratchett. Oh my God, I really got into the Discworld novels, and Douglas Adams mm-hmm. with um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh sure. my God, brilliant book. Um, ah, oh, so influential on me for so long. That was like I almost took that as a Bible. That one, and his Dirk mm-hmm. Gently books as well, which came out uh, back then. Um, uh, Holistic Detective Agency and mm-hmm. uh, Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. Those two two novels, they were oh my super faves. They're amazing. So long, yeah. That that those were massively influential on my thinking of the, the whole world. <laughs> yeah, I like those, and I like the the Xanth and the Incarnations of Immortality. By Piers Anthony, but what I, I really loved was Robert Asprin, the Myth series. Oh, yeah. We've yeah. probably talked about before. Oz and Skeev. They were uh, magicians, dimension traveling, and it was, they were very light, very comedic. And those first six books are they're just the best. They're so funny. So, uh, characters who are very sort of sniping at each other constantly, they're sort of insulting each other. Um, that was a massive influence on on me and what I like and what I try to write. I wanted to get into that. I've I've read the uh, the first book of the Fools series, which was his sci-fi yeah, version I, of that. I tried that. Eh, didn't like those as much personally. Yeah, I only read the first one, but I wanted to read the rest, but they just did not have them here, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Just did not pop up the 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 fools the first one in the fools that came up in in some kind of remainder and that's a lot of the more interesting books only ended up in australia in remainder sales you know when they used to have those big kind of things and um yeah you just would not see the interesting ones unless you could find them in the secondhand bookshops because they would only have like these particular main bestsellers in the um, the main bookshops, so that you just ne- would never see all the. I think they they did get the the myth ones, but by right. the time they popped up, I wasn't into fantasy so much anymore. And, uh, yeah, th- and those are tough to read as an adult. I tried rereading them, and yeah, not so much. 
<laughs> you have to catch them at the right time. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um the comedy comedy books. Yeah. I had a lot of great love for them. With I read some um yeah, I did get into um the uh Piers Anthony novels through the Zantz books when I was uh deathly ill at the one stage in my life with chicken pox. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, you know, at that age where you, um, you, like as a child, you don't get that ill with chicken pox. But as, a, as old, an older person, um, not that old, I was like 19 or something, I had them. And then you basically get meningitis and pneumonia and all this kind of life-threatening stuff. It just, just comes along for the yeah. ride. And so I was sick in bed for like a couple of months. And... So yeah, I devoured anything that I could get. Um, the Flashman Flashman books by uh, George MacDonald Fraser, loved them. Huge influence mm-hmm. on me and uh, in my development of Pinky, because uh, that is a vain, glorious, beautiful, beautiful character who is just so awful that he's uh, he's fantastic and antihero. And uh, the Zance books, which I you know loved. Because they were just so kinky and silly, and I yeah. loved that kinkiness in them. That really appealed to me. It was a very carry-on kind of humor in a way. It wasn't afraid to be childishly adult. Characters right. obsessed with other characters' panties and and all that kind of stuff. And right? Yeah, that definitely grabs you as a young teen. Yeah, but I wasn't a young teen. I was like nineteen or something, and that was just so, oh, okay. All right, right, so yeah. fun and refreshing. You know that kinkiness. Yeah. It was just so cool, and I really yeah. appreciate because everything else was very straight laced, you know. And even if it was something was sexy, it was more sexy in a more sober way. It wasn't sexy in a silly kind of kinky way, right? Which, uh, which is a lot of fun to read. So I really appreciated that. Although I came to the more um, uh, it was Piers Anthony books that I read, the more I came to realize he's actually really. He's not really a good writer. He's a, he's got a great imagination, but his prose is so stiff and clunky. It's, it's yeah, funny. and uh, I mean, you read more, and it definitely gets a little creepy as well. I, I don't yeah, really have it does. In a lot of the stuff, but yes, yeah, so that early <laughs> stuff though is really some of it is really great. And then, uh, yeah, maybe you get to know him a little too well, and it get, gets a little kind of creepy. Well, he, later on, he did but, not have. He, later on, he became a big deal. You know, I'm kind of a big deal. And then he said, <laughs> okay. That was the title of his one of his books. <laughs> you editors, <laughs> editors, you can just piss off. I don't need you. My books are fine as they are because right. I've talked to my fans and my fans love it. And so he no longer had uh, editors changing stuff and making yes. it better. So and that can yeah, it. be damaging. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is, really. He needed it. He literally did write in the end of his books about, yeah, this is how I'm going now. It's like it was almost like a blog. You know, he's writing these books back in the the 80s and the you know 70s, 80s, 90s. And in the back of the books, he'd he'd be writing about his process of, oh yeah, this is what I did when I wrote this book, and you know, blah blah blah, like people do now. You know, people will um, write write some kind of blog post or Facebook post. He was doing that back then in the back of his books and responding to fans and all this kind of stuff. So you knew Mm -hmm. his process about how he was going along. And, yeah, he he, he talked about how, yep, I'm a big deal now. Editors can (laughs) suck it. (laughs) I'm going to do what (laughs) I want. (laughs) And that's why he became, that's why he became more creepy. And that's why he became more cringy and stuff like that because right, just kind of unfettered, uh, exactly stream of consciousness or just sort of whatever. The George Lucas effect. Yes, just a... <laughs> yeah, that happened. Freedom from editors. <laughs> yeah, I can do what I want. Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> And he can still sell books because he's a bestseller, so it doesn't matter anymore. Because yeah, he is a big deal. Yeah, he can't. he's right about that. He's entitled to being a title. Yeah. 
He's he's allowed to to do it. Yep. Which um, let's okay. This is a bit of a tangent, but you've got George Lucas. He did that. He knew he could make money anyway because he was a big deal. But then you've got other directors, say like um, Spielberg, who was a big deal. But Spielberg yeah. has always. I don't really. I'm not really a fan of a lot of Spielberg films, especially his later ones. But um, he always he didn't sort of go crazy like that. He always stayed within the process, and still made you know films that people liked, and yeah. were good because he didn't you know become uh, a massive head. Yeah. Massive head. <laughs> For Scorsese, even more so. Like, yeah. Amazing that his quality stayed at the level it did when he could sort of probably get away with not working as hard and kind of, ah, it's good enough. Or taking over and saying, look, I don't care. Yeah, and like whatever his whims are, like this is the way it is. And no consultation about it. Exactly. They still work with good people and... Because yeah. Anyway, we're we're off the off the page there. So yeah, books that made us. Thing. Books that made us. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be just books, but a lot of things that uh, reach the screen, I, I suppose, came from books. Especially, <laughs> yeah. like there is a, uh, now there is this craze of adapting everything for the screen. Uh, like um, A Wrinkle in Time, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a book back then. And I Did you see the it. movie? No. Okay. I, I purposefully avoided it because I saw the trailer and it didn't... I, I didn't remember the book having that feel right. at all. Of course, I haven't read it in 20 years or something, but... Um, didn't feel like that. So I didn't want to spoil the memory that I have in my head of that book because I remember really liking it and I didn't uh, feel confident I would like the movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I didn't go see it. Oh. Um, that's that. interesting. Yeah, that's how I am now. I just will not bother with adaptions ever since, you know, Star Wars and The Hobbit and stuff like that. And it, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. I just think, you know, whatever. I like the book. I don't have to watch an adaption because I've read it already. So who cares? I I have um, so many mixed feelings about Lord of the Rings, uh, both as a book and as a movie. As a book, I it was uh, there was a, a period of time where I would read it every day, <laughs> all day. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I remember reading it with method in the sense that from the moment I realized that he had split basically the books into the two teams, I, I remember going to read all of what happened in with Frodo and, and, and Sam and then going to read all of what happened with everybody else. Yeah, it's uh, a bit annoying that, wasn't it? The appropriate chapters because I didn't want to wait. Yeah. Um, but just like with Victor Hugo, I had this huge issue with him that he would go on and on and on and on and on about lore and about details like how moist the grass was when he shouldn't, like when I wanted to get him to go on with it because things were happening yeah. and I wanted to go forward and I wasn't interested in the stupid grass. So please, can we please? You know, can we please move on and yeah. like go on to what she said? That would be nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember the frustration. Sometimes I tried to jump ahead, but then I jumped ahead too long ah. because they had already spoken about it. So I had to go back. <laughs> so you missed it. And, yeah. and just read through it. And that was my issue with the book. Well, and with the movie. Okay. It's that he sorry, sorry, I will I will end my rant in a second there. It's that the Peter Jackson starts off very faithfully and then he flies off. Yeah. As the movie says. 
Mm. And then he cut off the most important part of the book that, in my opinion, the most important part is the scarring of the sire because uh, there is a reason why it's there and he completely nuked that. So that's why I don't like movies. Yeah. I like them, but I don't like them. That. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I stopped after the second film. It was just too silly. I could see where it was going with the, so the action and stuff like that. And I thought, eh, I can see this is a big Hollywood thing. This has nothing to do with the... In the first film, yep. Oh my god, I was blown away. I loved it. I thought, oh wow, not only have they got the costumes and everything like that, but they've got the the feel of it and the walking feel because it was all based on walking, which is really mm. cool. And, you know, they have the, the small scaleness of it and the childishness of the initial adventure. And, you know, the, oh, it's a jolly good show and they'll be going off and then it's like a hint of tragedy with Boromir's death and all that. And, um... Yeah, so that that was really good, and then in the second book he just went, "Yep, just straight out normal, flat out modern Hollywood shit." Yeah. Whatever. But uh, for me, the books I initially loved them as an adventure. I had the same issue as you with the bastard splitting it up into this, splitting it up into that. But I would just you know grin and bear it, and still keep reading it. So I I would go through it as it was. And, you know, I, I really loved the, the stories. And I, I read it like, uh, I think maybe two or three times. Mm -hmm. and Me too. Yeah, because you have this thing where you think, yeah, it's a good adventure. I just loved like dipping into here again. And I tried to read it and I tried to read it every free, few years. But I discovered when I was a bit, <laughs> bit older, I couldn't go back into it. After reading a lot of other sci-fi and that kind of stuff, it just felt, far too uh, slow and English and prim and proper, which I just wasn't into. It's not that being prim and proper and slow in English is wrong or bad or not the way you should do it. It's just that my tastes had changed and I wasn't so much into that kind of thing anymore. So I couldn't get into the story at that stage, unfortunately. So, yeah, that, that changed for me. Which, you know, mm -hmm. that's a thing. You have to be in the mood for a book to be able to read it and get the most out of it. If you're not in the mood, yeah. then you can't read it. So yeah, that's that's definitely uh, a big big element, um, and also being also being ready for that book, I think, is also another thing. Um, because I remember, especially when uh, you get forced forced reading at school. And it's a book that is supposedly appropriate for kids, but in reality, it's not. <laughs> uh, then, and you are not ready for it. It it hurts you, and it doesn't give you the benefit that exists because you are not ready to receive it, in a sense. Yeah. Um, and that was um, always a big issue with reading lists. Oh, very uh, at least of, so. yeah there's they're, they're yeah. entirely counterproductive things you will enjoy and get so much out of as an older person when when mm -hmm. you're a teen or whatever you read them and you think this is the worst piece of crap ever why are you forcing us to read this and that can spoil you just completely because you'll always judge those books by that first experience so you mm -hmm. may not ever go back to that author. You'll just be, you know, scarred for life about them. So, so many people mm -hmm. don't go into the classics and read them. Like, um, I remember when I was reading, um, I think it was Pride and Prejudice or, you know, mm -hmm. Wuthering Heights. Or I, was, I was reading that when I was in my 20s or whatever. And people would come and look at it and go, oh, my God, do you have to read that for some kind of assignment? oh, God, I, I would hate reading that kind of thing. And they could not imagine reading that for pleasure, which I was. I was reading Pride and Prejudice and um, Wuthering Heights, those kind of books for pleasure, because I, I was never forced to read those when I was in school. I was forced to read other books. So I avoided that, and so I could, I could still get the pleasure out of them. But others couldn't, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big, big issue. Definitely. Uh, I remember 
a lot of, of um, I, I would say that we don't really have dedicated children's literature in Greece in the sense that, uh, you know, watered down stuff. There are stuff that have perhaps elements that are more children friendly, but they aren't books that are um, that that would 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 caution kids very easily from certain things. So you have to pick your your uh, content very very carefully because if the content is harsh, it will be harsh, and it doesn't matter who the book is marketed to. So there, there is also that. And I remember we were forced to read this uh, this book about war, and it was so traumatic because it was so graphic that I didn't read that author again until I was maybe 25. And I was, it took me 10 years basically yeah. to go back to that author. And by chance, really, I didn't. Yeah, it, you, it you happened. Seek them out after that, you go. Yeah, I. Yes, I know that author, but I'm not going to read them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge. And, and thing. I don't know. Did you guys catch this wave? This wave of newer, newer literature for kids that was very anti-war and. No, we are the world, we are the children, sort of thematology. Did you ever get the, that sort of thing? Uh, no, because I didn't really read modern books. Back then I was reading stuff that was all written in the 1930s, 19, you know, 1940s, that kind of stuff. That was my thing. Mm. So I was very old-fashioned for a long time <laughs> in my tastes. So I didn't get up to the future until... Much later. <laughs> yeah, I missed that um, stuff too. I was reading older stuff. Yeah. I, I read all of those as well. And that was also like a class of attitudes. And there was this subtle war between anti-war people and pro-war people in a sense. In the books in the book industry, in the book business, or I don't know. And and you had titles thrown at you as a kid, at least in my side of the world, where you had one book that was very vividly anti-war and one book that was very vividly pro-war. So you were very confused as a kid as to yeah. <laughs> what, you should, uh, what you should take from its book, if you didn't have, if you didn't have people to talk about it with, if you didn't have um, some kind of point of reference, you could be very, very lost because they were all very, very powerful authors, but they were thrown at you without any sort of guidance, in a sense. Okay. And that can be problematic as well. Yeah, yeah, because then you're mm -hmm. exposed to competing viewpoints, and it's very, it would be very confusing as a child because as a child you take things more, um, you know, authority means a lot more to you. And as you said before, if they're in books, they have a lot of authority to a child. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, that can be very problematic. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I I came to. When I was younger, I came to think that uh, the books were um, superior to comics because I was taught that. So books were, yes, of course, um, yeah, yeah. Books, books were basically <laughs> superior to everything. Books were superior to movies and you know everything else. The book was the the the, the gold standard, especially the comics. So yeah, I. I stopped reading comics at a young age and just started reading books because I thought, yeah, that's that's what you gotta read. And unfortunately because <laughs> there is there is no difference between books and comics apart from the illustrations. They are mm -hmm. on equal levels, basically. 
yeah, they can be, I mean, there can be books that are just, just the most juvenile and uh, badly written. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Junk, and there could be comics that are obviously that are, that are like that, but also that are really literate, and really insightful, and tell you something about, you know, what it means to be a human being, and like give you all this historical context. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the, the same the, writing, uh, amazing stuff. In, yeah, in exactly. The same sort of range book. in uh, both mediums. Yeah. yeah, and the same skills that are used to create one. Are used to create the other so it's yeah there is no difference so i was not influenced by many book many comics although you know when i was really young i did read a lot of action comics which are the ones about you know uh for the 19 they they're probably all written in from the 1950s to the 1980s or whatever but they're all set in world war ii <laughs> 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 They're all Americans in tanks and British in tank drivers and stuff like that, and warships and uh-huh. fighter planes and things. And those were the things that I really did enjoy when I was really young. So I read a lot of those. And uh, it, those weren't pro-war as much as they just were war. That's all they were. <laughs> right. There was no, nothing uh, philosophical or political. It was more like biggles, you know. It's just adventures. Mm-hmm. Very simplistic. Wait. Perhaps we should wrap up. <laughs> <'Cause around laughs> right now. No, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just thinking that we have said which books and, and titles uh, were with us, but we haven't said yet how they affected us in what we create yeah. right now as much. That's true. That's true. Well, um, my books did uh, very much affect me, you know. From the early times I was reading, as I said before, books that were written in the 30s and the 40s and stuff like that. So I have that old-fashioned sensibility. So that's probably a big reason why Pinky T.A. is set in the 1920s, you know, part of it. So I can I can include that. Um, Flashman, of course, the the novels by George MacDonald Fraser. So I've got um, a bit of that anti heroiness in my books. At least I would in my comics. At least I would want to think that I had that in there. And um, yeah, the the sexiness of the sci fi that I read later on. I think I've uh, I've got a bit of that in my uh, in my work. So I think all of it and the kinkiness of um, uh, Piers Anthony at his best. Mm. You know, all that kind of thing has influenced. There's political stuff in there as well, even though I didn't read too many political books. <laughs> that's in there from somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> Maybe that's just from watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What about you, Bones? So, oh, Tans. Tell us, Tans. Albanes first. Yeah, well, I would say there are a couple of favorites I didn't mention. Stephen King's It at the time when I was a young teenager was incredible. It was my favorite book. I read it twice in a row. Wow. I literally finished the last page. It's a, you know, it's a 1,500-page book. And then I immediately started the book again and read the whole thing again. Uh, I tried to read again recently, and it didn't really yeah. – I got partway in and loved it, and then I kind of stalled out a bit. Yeah. But the that was a massive influence. Um, so was Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, mm. it was sort of, I love that book so much. And I read it again recently, and I loved it again. But I love that genre. I love the, and that led yeah. to the slasher genre and, like, stuff I like. But but also the interest in structure. Like, in, like having a page turner that has a structure. Um, I, I like, I really like that kind of stuff. I don't know if I put it in my, what I write or my comic necessarily, but uh, I like, I do like that. Um, and I like thinking about it and analyzing it sort of. Uh, so I would say the, the lonely characters and the sort of, the sort of melancholy of the, the kids in it, uh, structurally the Agatha Christie book 
the, the, the idea of standalone stories, very appealing to me. That, that would be the Hardy Boys thing. Um, mm-hmm. there's, an, there's an attitude, like a sassiness and a dialogue and a, a vitriol, but a friendly, loving kind of vitriol between characters that came from the myth books and uh, Mad Magazine and stuff like that, um, and Archie comics. Um, oh, yeah. The humanity, a lot of it from X-Men, like Uncanny X-Men comics, like that was a massive influence um, in that way. Um, and Oz, like you said, the, uh, the sort of sexiness in a comedic way yeah, that kind of comes from Xanth, and also for me from Archie, that, that yeah, I get that. I sort of try to capture that in uh, a lot of stories. So. Oh, how cool. Yeah. yeah. It's good to know your influences. Because then you can really go back and uh, examine them. I don't know if I should say this publicly. Now that I said it, I'm like, this should be private stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nobody listened to this anyway. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, what about Intense? you? Um, well, definitely, uh, in everything I write, there is absolutely social discourse, and there are a lot of things that have a political streak, that are situations of a political hue or an ethical, ethical conundrum uh, uh, that I put my characters in. And that definitely comes from all the literature that I have read that is about it and is about that. And all the characters that I have followed, especially from the Greek literature, that the whole point of them is they make a choice, one basic choice, and this changes them throughout the story. And and I think that this uh, exists a lot in my characters as well, not only in comics, but also in the novels yeah. that I write. So I think uh, this definitely is a, a recurrent theme. I also have a bit of a of a pretty nature in the sense that <laughs> I always have characters that are straight arrows that show you how things should be. And that is also from reading books that have characters like that, who are the right ones. You want to do it right all the time. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but mine maybe are a little bit more unlucky than those I read. Mm. Uh, so there's also that. And... Finally, I, I think that I also have this whole team up thing. Uh, like I, I, I tend to, to, to get my characters into mismatched teams because again, I used to read a lot of books like this, like uh, having teams with a lot of characters that clash in between and have friction, but they have to work together. Yeah. Yeah. That. Well, you've got that uh, that prototype in um, Lord of the Rings, haven't you, as well? Mm-hmm, 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 definitely. That's a huge part of it. Oh, that's interesting. I Actually, that brings up something that I'd like to talk about, which is um, maybe for a future Quackcast, uh, mm-hmm. the, the idea of um, where do things originally come from, you know, like, say, in um, Lord of the Rings influenced the whole idea in modern fantasy and, and modern um uh you know Dungeons and Dragons all that was all influenced by the fact that Lord of the Rings happened to have a party of a bunch of people and now the the prototype for ever after in Dungeons and Dragons was um you know you have to have a mage and you have to have this guy and you have to have that guy and, have, and so that came from there and then that influenced all these kind of things massively further on you know all these role playing games and that kind of stuff and fantasy was just all based on that idea and that that's an interesting thing to me just to talk about origins of tropes like that but maybe mm-hmm. we can do that in a, in a future quick cast because yeah that is I a know. side issue for this one <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Well, this has been, um, yeah, fascinating. And I'd like to, if people could talk, talk about their uh, literary influences, that would be really cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. This is a big part of the Quackcast number 386. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.